This is Otaku Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We dig deep into the great anime of the past to give you the context you need to fully appreciate the best this medium has to offer. Let's jam. Welcome to the broadcast. I hope you're having a good day, wherever you happen to be right now. Uh, this is Otaku Station, and today we'll be talking about the original 1995 Ghost in the Shell. As a reminder, we've been spending the past couple of broadcasts watching the movie, and today we'll sit down and talk about what this movie is at a high level, its themes, and what it's exploring. Now, Steve's on his way back to his tower, but in the meantime, I love talking animation, so let me talk about the animation of this movie. Let's head down to the animation room. All right, let's talk about the animation of this movie. There are some beautifully executed sequences of movement in this film, of course, but they're mostly fan service. Bear with me. We typically use the word fan service to mean nudity or other etchy elements, but it can also more generally mean elements meant to appeal to fans, like the nerdy jokes in the Big Bang Theory or the references to uh, geeky movies and TV shows in things. It's a form of fan service. Most of Ghost in the Shell's high-budget animation sequences are a form of fan service for a young male action movie demographic, right? You get the, you know, exploding heads, guns blazing, fight scenes with a lot of movement in them, and, yes, nudity. The only other places animation budget is used notably, other than for, you know, little naturalistic movement, is to draw the viewer's eye for quick comedic or dramatic effect, like when the garbage truck goes airborne when the driver realizes they've been found out. This is actually doing both of those at once. It's comedic because, well, it's, you know, that, that's not what a truck's supposed to do, uh, especially a garbage truck, um, but it also draws your attention to realize, oh, the driver has realized what's going on and is now panicking. Um, very smart. So we see animation budget used for some of those sequences, but again, otherwise, it's mostly pew pew or boob boob, frankly. Um, and again, that is, that is a choice. I'm not arguing, I'm just pointing that out. Um, otherwise, there's not much animation. The shots are pretty static. Characters are just kind of sitting there or standing there without much movement. Maybe a head turn here and there, but very simple animation otherwise, in that sense. Granted, this ties into the theme. The humans all act remarkably like dolls or robots because this is all about the question of are, how human are you when you have lost most of your human body and you're just a mind. Uh, so the fact that the characters don't move much, that they are still and kind of robotic, fits the theme. And to that point, Oshii chose a very naturalistic approach for his animation. People move like live-action humans. In fact, much of the movie might as well be rotoscoped, i.e. drawn over live-action footage. I'm not saying it was, I don't think it was, but um, in terms of how the camera is positioned, so to speak, and how the characters move, it looks much like rotoscoped action. So there's not a lot to say about that uh, from an animation perspective, because it's just, you know, how would a person walk? Let's just do that. And again, not complaining, that is... That is an artistic choice. Uh, let's finish up by talking about the color scheme. This is a very dark movie. Uh, lots of blues and grays, um, lots of dark colors. Um, lighter colors are mostly white or beige. Um, here you see again, the sky here is kind of blown out in this is not even a bright white, it's kind of a dirty white, and you see you know, Bato's beige coat there. Not a lot of, of bright primary colors, even the sort of Kowloon style city that they're all in tends towards darker tones and grimier colors 
than the bright primary colors you often see in uh, an, uh, other anime series. And this fits. This is a movie about dark themes and deep philosophy. It should be dark. So anyway, those are some thoughts on the animation. Let's head on back up to the tower. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Steve's back in his tower. So let me get Steve and John on the line to finish our talk on Ghost in the Shell. All right, it looks like we have John and Steve back on the line to dig further into Ghost in the Shell. We've already seen it. We've already talked about it. I've edited out all of the stuff that I can't broadcast. And we can go into our thoughts on the movie. And boy, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I'd like to start by asking you all, what are the themes of the movie? Like, what kind of movie is this? What tone is it setting? And what kind of uh, um, questions is it asking you that you can kind of pull out of the movie? Hmm. Well, as the title suggests, Ghost in the Shell. So it's talking about, well, we definitely have the, the, the thought of what does it mean to be human? There's a, there's a specific thing about being human. That's mm. having your ghost. Or as it says in the movies a couple times, you know, my ghost speaks to me. Yeah. And it's this idea of when the technology is, 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 is such, as, as you pointed out, you have 20 copies of yourself, but the ghost can only go so far. Yeah. You know, it, it, it is in unknown quantity that is attached to you mm -hmm. it is it, you know so people wonder if it is it the soul is it you know what is it and how is it cohabitating with the technology in there and we don't really get a firm answer on that we, we don't really get a oh this is what your ghost is right right yeah <clears throat> you know this is what it is and it's, it's just so this amorphic thing that everyone just kind of goes uh, soul, maybe? Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and you think, like, just what you were saying, my, my ghost speaks to me. So who is me? Yeah. Right. Is, if the ghost's me, how can it speak to me? Like, there's a lot of complicated questions. There. Yes. Sort of like speaking to Siri. Siri speaks to you. Mm. You're, you know what I mean? Like, mm. is the ghost Siri speaking to you as a person? Or are mm -hmm. you, Siri, speaking to a machine you know what I mean? mm -hmm. where does where's the cross between that it, um it, it's yeah. it feels like watching this it's not a dystopian future okay so it doesn't right. it's not as bleak as i think it could be interpreted <laughs> as um because it doesn't seem like the the human machine interface is necessarily generally bad Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have some examples of it hacking people's memories, altering perception that are not good. But by and large, everyone generally seems to be just getting on with their lives, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so that the this greater integration of like the the machine learning and, and AI or whatever else yeah. things are powering yeah. behind the, the the ghost. Yeah, um, it doesn't seem to disrupt the general experience. I, I would kind of relate it to, say, The Wire, right? Where, right. you know, that's not a dystopian view of society or anything. It's just set in a particularly dark place, right? Or it's a particular, right. you know, yeah. a really difficult uh, aspect of civilization. Yeah. Much but, like the rest of life, there are bright and shiny sides. There mm -hmm. are dark and unpleasant yeah. sides. And then yeah. there's the sort of very middling sort of gray area. Yeah. And and to that point, just and to avoid getting into the weeds, but cyberpunk tropes usually have a dystopian thing about it, but this doesn't really have a dystopian thing necessarily about it. There are interesting questions about intransience by the governments using the technology, yeah. but it's not well, the same thing as, as the government being all oppressive and all right. that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there are, you know, to that point... Um, there are negatives to the society in the sense of things right. like having your body taken over or your memories taken over, right? right. These consequences of technology, which is a very cyberpunk element that you know, technology right. goes too far. But absolutely to your point, this is a functioning uh, uh, society. Uh, it's just that there are good and bad things. Yeah, this is not Neo-Tokyo. Right. Yeah. <laughs> where you know where you've had 
disastrous things occur and there's just there's a sort of rot mm -hmm. that's underneath the the underpinnings yeah. of what the military and the government's trying to basically hold everything together with band-aids and bubblegum yeah. and bailing wire <laughs> yeah. this is by and large i mean one of the, the the features that we have where somebody where you know memory hacking becomes a thing mm -hmm. is you have garbage collectors yeah which if you if you want to liken this to the sort of dystopian bad future mm. akira is rife with just decay destruction mm. just general things yeah this you actually have city services that are actually functioning yeah yeah it's true. the things that are going on are unusual with them but they're collecting trash they're just going around doing the thing these are all yeah. normal functions and you could argue this is kind of a metaphor for section nine right taking out the trash uh you know, right yeah. Yeah. a little silly but that is the, the whole point is that um, section nine is here to uphold law and order. <coughs> right. right. Ideally. Yeah. So when they, when they, as we go through the movie mm. and we, we were, you know, they bring up the, again, the ghost, you know, you have this sense that it's this subconscious thing that it's, you know, you know, when we were talking about who is talking to whom, maybe it's just this subconscious element that people yeah. don't really, you know, understand and we see scenes like this one where um, I think is is this the boat scene? I think so. Um, yeah, where yeah. Mm. Kusanagi is is replaying how she was, how her current form was made, mm. how she's floating up and up from the river and with her android body and trying to re-experience kind of a human emotion or something. Mm. And then we get as she's talking with Bauto at, at the by the end of the scene. You know, we get this voice that comes out of nowhere, and everyone, and both of them are looking at each other, going, "You said that, right? No, I, I, I did not say that." And so it, it kind of wonders. Then that's the point: is that what was that? Was that the yeah. city? Was that was that Kusanagi's ghost? Was that what was that? Mm -hmm. I think that gets to another theme of Ghost in the Shell, which is a contemplation on what your body means to you. Um, what. Right. You know, in a world where bodies are replaceable, is a body important? If the body is important, how so? Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the movie, you know, later on is the fact that the major becomes willing to part with her body, right? She can let that go and have a completely new right. body because it's not that important to her, um, even though it is a very carefully crafted machine right but what is mm -hmm. you know what does that mean are, are we the same uh, how intertwined is our body and ourselves i guess would be the theme there and well certainly was... from from thinking about this as we're talking about it as we go along conceptually it feels like the mirror that we're we're placed in front of that's placed mm -hmm. in front of us for us to look at is the major has a highly technologically advanced body. Mm -hmm. Her ghost speaks to her. That is not any different than the biological flesh flesh pod that our consciousness lives in, mm -hmm. that it is driven by the concepts and ideas of the self mm -hmm. that makes this machine work. So it's like this is, you know, it's sort of an interesting sort of mirror to be like, you know, you don't have to be a machine to hear that voice. It drives right. what the biological function does. Mm -hmm. But do you really think about it? Mm -hmm. You know, this is all if you yeah. strip out the technology to it. It's like, what are you doing when that voice inside your head says turn left or turn right? Yeah. What yeah. are the greater themes of like you on the inside? Your shell is your flesh shell. Mm -hmm. It's not the machine shell, yeah. but it's still the same kind of question is where does your humanity lie right. in that? What is the internal mm -hmm. dialogue to you mean that drives the motion, the, the, mm -hmm. the interface that you're doing yeah. with the outside world? Well, and what's, what's like, mm. yeah. So what's interesting about that is that in this world uh, that Kusanagi is in, that everybody's in the shell, as you pointed out, is it's, it, it's, you know, which is more important, the machine or the biological yeah. kind does, doesn't really matter. Uh, because in this, we get this conversation from this mm -hmm. scene where um, Kusanagi makes it a point to say, 
or Bato, I think, is makes it a point to say, we don't own our bodies. Yeah. The government does. And so it's just our minds that, that we own. So if we take everything away, all that's left is, is that mind. So that's mm -hmm. why the, the ghost is so important when you're going into a, a, a different body, because that body may not belong to you anymore. Mm -hmm. So the body doesn't really matter to a certain mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's when the ghost becomes far more more important. You know, the you know, as as you pointed out, John, you know, to drive the biological functions, turn left, turn right, go forward, backwards, you know, do the thing. But if you take all that away, you still have a brain inside of a right. brain case that is thinking and there's that little voice back there that's subconscious that's like is your soul? Is it you know what it is? It yeah. what is what's driving your morals and things like that. So the the shell here is literally almost unimportant. And and as you as you all pointed out, in you know Kusanagi does give up her body, right? And it doesn't matter, it, right? And the way that she treats it at the end when she's going up against the touch coma, that's a whole other idea of her how she sees it. But then you know, but that then is complicated by the fact halfway through. With the yes, where is it? Not there. Not there. Where is it? There it is. Almost there. Holds it. Um, the scene in on the river in the rain. Right. Where one of the big themes of this scene is how the major is looking around at her environment and she's seeing reminders of herself. She sees a what appears to be a copy of herself in a in a window. Um, and it may just be another of her bodies, another model of her, you know. This this physical body is probably not unique to her, so there are other versions of her around. Um, and I have a quick question, Brent. Yeah. I don't remember. Do we see the Major eat or drink? We mm. do. Do we? Do we not? I don't believe we do. But okay. Batow does, and, and he's the same... In right, but he's but like, is less less altered. Okay, no. go ahead, Brent. I didn't. I, I think he's the same. He's the same. He he just has a brain inside of his shell. Yeah. Really? I thought he only yeah. had like the eyes and like some. No, more no, minor no. He's a he's a total, okay. The only person, the only two people in Section Nine that are not that augmented are Tokusa and Aramaki. Right. And Aramaki still has a little bit more mental augmentation yeah. than Tokusa does. Tokusa is okay. really the, the most and human I, one. I think Ishikawa. Like some of his body is is still human, yeah. still human because he's he's a hacker. So, yeah, you know the, right. the body isn't. But yeah, no, I uh, I think they're the same. Uh, to be to to be fair, that could be one of those things where it's like there are just no eating scenes in the movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But to but, the point that I had made about hmm. her, if this is what if. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's drinking a drink. Mm -hmm. So this might not be just necessarily. Right another it's another you know major there they they made a whole series of them yeah this could be her yeah. what would have happened if i hadn't altered mm -hmm. what right. would happen if i had a human body i could sit and enjoy a drink at a cafe and but, i think this this goes back to what they were talking about before where you see them drinking the beers and they can decide how that beer tastes they can decide right. how how drunk they get and does that cheapen the experience when you know, you're in total control. Um, yeah. And to that point, like this, in this entire sequence, the major sees other bodies that goes from this to mannequins to these very um, stripped down mannequins, like they're just kind of heads and torsos. Um, and the implication being that the major is thinking a lot about her body and thinking a lot about what her body means to her and that potentially, like, there is some value to that, um, especially as she's in this very complicated social environment, lots of people around, right, interaction being important. Um, also a lot of trash implying that maybe she wants to kind of throw away her body. Right. Um, but I think that, that that's an interesting element here where they're, where they're saying, you know, yes, absolutely, to your point, Steve, um, the major sees herself as, sees her body as disposable, but... Um, maybe there's a part of her that kind of wishes it wasn't, right? Um, yeah, I think it's, those are all really good points. Um, yeah. Well, I know we, we've seen from all of this, and I didn't realize Bato was was that altered mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. The 
again hearkening back to the sort of the the flesh to the id the mm. concept of self the, the sort of self-containedness of being someone yeah. that you see a lot of these kind of questions where she's looking around at this and to your point where it's like is she disposable yeah is she a mannequin mm-hmm. is she a person what what is the self that the major actually is is she a, a possession of the government like Bato says mm-hmm. or does that is that you know completely incidental to the fact that they are what they actually are they're not yeah. just tools they are people and this gets back to I think classical Greek arguments about the nature of humanity and and of some of them saying basically um, well it was common in ancient Greece to kind of come up with this, this duality that there is the mind and the body right and the mind is basically a the, the body is basically this this fleshy container for the mind and the mind is the most important thing and we just kind of walk around in this body and it's kind of you know is kind of our uh, kang to our brain if you will um but that a lot of other philosophy, particularly Asian philosophy, say, no, 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 like, the body is part of who we are. Like, you can't just slice off the brain and then pretend that you will be the same person. Your body embodies your experiences and so forth, and that is part of who you are. Mm. And so I think this gets to a lot of those themes, too, of saying there is this traditional duality between brain and body, now that we can enforce that duality and have two completely different things, what does that mean? And I think the, the existence of a ghost is a way of saying maybe there's more to it than that. That it's not just, you know, the mind is not just a bunch of electrical signals. Neurons. Yeah, yeah there, there, there's more going on to what makes us human than just our brain. Right. Um, but who knows? Um, and to that point, uh, well, actually, let's 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 reverse back a little bit. Let, let's let's talk about to that point what this movie sets up. <coughs> I think a lot of this is very much set up in this opening sequence of Ghost in the Shell. Uh, when we talked about this movie before, uh, I made this joke about pointer scenes that in. Uh, action movies, you have this idea of the pointer scene, which is where inevitably all the characters have to sit down and say, okay, here's the score, here's the heist, here's the background, here's what the Ark of the Covenant is, you know, all of that. That just, no matter how well you write your story, eventually there's some kind of dialogue scene where somebody is saying, you know, info dumping to somebody else, exactly. And that Ghost in the Shell is about 50% pointer scenes. (laughs) Um, But I think that's an important aspect to what this movie is. One of the downsides, I think, of Ghost in the Shell is because of the time it came out and the nature of what it was and how um, influential it was or could be, it was often pitched as an action movie. I think a lot of people see it and think it's an action movie, and it is not. No. It has action sequences 100%. Right. But it is a it is a presentation of a world along with a philosophical meditation on what it means to be human with boobs and blowing people's heads off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the it's real almost world. As if, right. no, It's almost as if Werner Herzog said, I will make a animated movie about this dark, <laughs> dark period of the mind. Exactly. But I think you see a lot of this in this opening sequence, right? You have, um, you know, uh, the major surveilling this situation. You see the all the dialogue happening in this sequence is a very dialogue heavy sequence early on a lot of just people talking about things you don't really understand unless you're paying really close attention to what's going on there's a ton of factions in this movie who's doing what who's betraying whom uh much more than a typical action movie would have um you think die hard there's not a lot of factions in die hard yeah right um does mission impossible not have different sections come on (laughs) 
but then you have these this this duality of the major being able to hold a carry on a conversation without using her body at all um and then using this these very advanced technologies to infiltrate and take care of this 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 guy um using this high technology so i think a lot of these themes are all like right here in this opening sequence Well, it certainly sets up for where the action's going for the entirety of the film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then I think th- those also uh, reflect at, on the ending of the movie, where so many of these thing- themes, I think, come back to four. Now, this is arguably one of the more iconic action scenes in film, certainly an animated film of the 90s. And what's interesting about it, looking back on it, is it's a thinking person's action scene. The major does no damage to her enemy yeah. until the very end, and even there, she's just trying to get the hatch open. <laughs> yeah, she's trying to make it waste all his ammunition because she, as a cyborg, is faster than a tank. So she's outwitting the. I, I, I'm referring to the tank as though it's a autonomous being. There's a pilot. Um, right. But there's, there's a uh, thing, but you know, it's all of this beautiful action, just to w- wear it down until she can actually do her one thing, which she fails at. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I think Bato says to her, you know, what are you taking up? What are you taking? You know, taking it on with? Yeah. And, like she makes very clear that she has. Nothing that's armor piercing. <laughs> like there's, yeah. she, all she could do is sort of distract mm-hmm. this thing long yep. enough to wait for the eventual ammo to run out, and mm-hmm. that's about it. Yep, exactly. Um, and meanwhile, we get a lot of these these themes repeated: the the use of shooting up the uh, tree of life, um, the idea that right. we're we're destroying all that, um, but that it's. It's the major using her her mind and her ghost to overcome a shell. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, kind of to your point, Steve, ab- about kind of the, this ending, it's really about the the major deciding to use her mind as a body, if you will. In the mm-hmm. end, let's be honest, right? This is the the puppet master is asking her to breed with him. To create a new organism, yeah. you know, effectively, mentally, and she submits to that. Um, and this ties into these themes that she biologically can't do that with her cyborg body. She cannot have children. That's just not a thing they they can do in this universe. Um, and so she is able to do something that her that her shell cannot do with her mind with this other person. It's this passing down of of um, both of them. The the mm-hmm. you know the puppet master, which turns out to be an actual AI, mm-hmm. not even a human being, yeah. <clears throat> with the understanding that he's evolved to a point, and he has said that okay, well, I've gotten this far, but I can't go any further. Yeah, I can experience death, but I can't experience creation. Yeah, uh, the actually, only way I, I can. Kind of the opposite. He can, he can yeah, create, yeah. but he can't die. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what he wants to do is he he does want to die. I mean, that's yeah. part of what have, he feels yeah. is, is the experience. Die, yeah. 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 But he doesn't want to do that without passing down his own legacy. That's mm-hmm. what his desire is. And the major is thinking through this. Yeah, she wants to create. She wants to have this other thing. And she could have easily have said, "No, that's it. It's done." You know, they would have yeah. taken her back to section nine, given her blah 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 blah. blah. But she decides, well, no, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where we kind of wonder, is this the subconscious ghost saying, is this the choice? This is the choice we want to make. Yeah. Because because when that happens, that ghost should theoretically go away. Mm -hmm. And with this creation of this new new entity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I think we brought up. Didn't they show a DNA sequence? at one point in this maybe i don't remember i i thought they did because mm-hmm. then we would we'd likened that to programming 
hmm. that the DNA sequencing is a program for a biological entity. Sure. Oh, if and you're talking that, about, yeah. I th I thought we talked about that. Hmm. Um, and like this is kind of sequencing the puppet master's hmm. data in with the major. Yeah. Exactly. So it very much is like, oh, well, you take 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, yep. slam them together, you get something different. Yep. And it's like, this is the closest thing that a digital entity could do to mm -hmm. sequence in to create something, create a different thing. Yep. And it's like, wow, okay, that's how very... How very digital of yeah. a biological <laughs> process. Mm -hmm. you know? and, rem and remember, it was the AI that chose the major to do that with. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he doesn't have a ghost. So how is he able to make these decisions? Mm -hmm. yeah. And why not Bato? Right. <laughs> you know? If Bato is as altered, or is the, the major, it, she feels like she's altered way more than, Bal than Bato. Is that true I, or not? I, I, They're exactly I believe, the same. Um, well, they don't have exactly the same, you know, bodies. Obviously, you know, they're, they're different models. But right, I believe right. they are both uh, just brains, brain and brainstem. Okay. Yeah, that's so it. Yeah. it specifically targeted her versus it could have targeted Bato. Yeah, right. So it's an interesting or choice. Any number of other cyborgs, right? They're not the only right. cyborgs in the world, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Um, which then begs the question. Why was the major open to this? Because we don't see indications earlier. You know, we see that she doesn't care about her shell, but this is a this has nothing to do with her shell. Uh, this is yeah. purely you are this consciousness. We are going to create a new consciousness out of the two of us. Are you up for that? Um, it also opens this interesting question of. So one of the other themes of the movie, or kind of symbols of the movie, is that. So many of the humans don't act human. They act robotic. They act like puppets. Uh, because presumably, potentially, this world has kind of done that to them. Um, is the Major kind of bored with her existence? Has she engineered her existence to a point where there are no surprises anymore? Right? Right. And now the Puppet Master has kind of picked up on that from... You know, sifting through details about her on the net to be able to say, ah, this person has gotten to such a high level that now they're open to this kind of major change. Ha ha ha. Major. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, say, so, and it's, yeah, you know, that's an interesting question about, like, why, why is she in section nine special from mm. you know anybody else in section nine yeah. why is she special from the in the opening scenes where we have the guy with diplomatic immunity yeah you see that he is all parts and pieces of a of a android as well so it's like you know there are presumably other people out there who are bored and yeah. intellectually curious about possibilities mm-hmm and it's like, you know, again, well, stupid. It's the, how the right how the writer made this because yeah, otherwise yeah. you could just have the story be well, somewhere else and it would never be. You would never know. I would also argue symbolically, she is the only female cyborg we know. Right. And so We've the seen the idea Aramaki's of you know triplets. Well, yeah, female, uh, but, but I, I believe like those female. are all androids. Those are all artificials. I believe. Okay. Um, but, and so again, yeah. the idea of birth—you know—you need somebody to give birth, and so right. you know. Um, although, as, as we, we mentioned in the, in, the, in the earlier the earlier part, we have no idea if the major was originally female, like biologically. Right. Uh, who point. knows? Yeah, um, to to in, that really. point, just just to point out, canon. Yeah. That has never been established. Right. Yeah. That mm. that, that for anybody watching is that has never well, I been think, established. Um, and Doesn't... in the series, they. Oh, in the movie, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah she she talks yeah. about a little bit about it, but you know, it's it's never been established about exactly what her gender was. Yeah. Um, so is the movie her assigned gender? Is the say. movie pushing then more of a gendered approach where the major is a woman, therefore, puppet master approaching her to create life would be more gender specific or... I, 
I, would I don't argue, think so. I would argue we're speaking uh, in terms of symbols here, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the major <clears throat> is a is female because that is the symbol of birth, and so okay. you know, uh, he, it puppet master, needs someone with whom uh, it can create a new life, and so mm. the the most appropriate symbol of that is for her to be female. Uh, it, it, Females it, it, are you yeah, have the fertility, right, so, right, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah fertility. Which, what, and, and remember that, that the AI, the puppet master, is also right has no gender. And well, which, yeah, the it, it it inhabits a shell that has a gender that is female appearance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, right. the, and that was the thought that just came to my mind. It's like, well, the puppet master actually technically is in a shell that looks yeah. like something, mm -hmm. but it transcends that yeah. to reach out to the main. Right. And because of the larger point, um, is the major a woman, right? Like, right. Does she, she has no womb, presumably. Um, yeah. How much of, of a traditional female anatomy does she have? She has breasts, right? Like, there, there, there's a lot of um, um, elements here that make her, you know, not female in the sexual sense right right um point being that she is symbolically the mother right which but in looking at this she is definitely if you put her and bato next to each other right. you could definitely <laughs> say that there is a gender differentiation yes. in the shells 100 yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah well it is definitely felt about bato because he yeah he has a strong attraction <laughs> very strong attraction and it should be pointed out, especially in the manga, she is absolutely capable of the, the mm -hmm. full, she, she is fully functional, you know. Yes. Oh, she's like Data. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 100%. Exactly. Um, but Oshi in this movie is um, complicating that, right? The, the whole point of this is to make her um, less human in that sense, you know, less biologically, physically having the same... Um, equipment because the whole point is it doesn't matter you know in this society you can do whatever you want and he wants to explore that i think here which i, I th you know that's really interesting in thinking about that through the whole film despite sort of the gendered appearance mm. that she maintains through most of the film yeah she doesn't really seem to like embody any kind of gendered interests necessarily right. Where right. one would be like, oh, no, it's that the major, you know, obviously a woman. Yeah. Like, um, most of what she says has got nothing really to do with that much of womanhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And <clears throat> um, there's something that, that, that they delve into more in the other adaptations because right. when you're dealing, when you, when an organization like Section 9 needs to blend in, they need to be able to do a lot of things with society. So you can't have people who are, um, who would stand out. You know, you have to be people who would look like they would be standing on a street corner. So you do have right. people who look traditionally male, traditionally female, like that, that, that blends in. Um, but that's really the primary reason, arguably, that they have those bodies. It's not because Aramaki says, I need a female over there, right? It's just um, uh, we need general human bodies. Job-specific uh, mm -hmm. personnel. Yeah. Right. Um, they could all be like Jameson in uh, Cinnamon Complex. You remember remember him, uh, uh, Steve? The, the brain in a box. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> God. So it's literally just brain in a box walking around with, like, Japanese fans with a Texas accent going, I'm so glad to be a robot. And he flashes these fans and has the Japanese flag on it. It's just oh, yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. Okay. It's a great character. Yeah, he's great. Uh, he's, he's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of the... A lot of the themes being explored here is this question of, well, what do bodies really matter? Um, but then the other interesting question to that, and I'm thinking about it, is um, why can't the puppet master breed? Like an amoeba, right? Right. Um, why does he need something else to, to do, which further complicates the question of body and, like, do you need another person and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Right. I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, my guess is that uh, because he's looking for life to live a life, mm -hmm. and if he wants to 
create a new being from himself if he were just to you know just reprogram basically mm -hmm. um you know into another bo body he's literally just taking a part of him and putting it into another body that's all he's doing he's not really creating anything new per se mm -hmm. but just if he melts paste, yeah paste. just copy and paste mm -hmm. exactly so if he goes with somebody who's willing like the major and says okay and like you were saying john you know combine all that data into something a new entity mm -hmm then he's creating life mm. and that's kind of what he wants to do or mm. i'm saying he but but it right. whatever um so i think that that it, that's why he just doesn't make more copies he probably could have made more <clears throat> like yeah. well, thousands no, but, of copies of himself, oh, you know? to be clear i'm not saying copies i, I mean like 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 <clears throat> cell subdivision because um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. he uh, he does bring that up of saying i could make copies of myself but it's just not like copies of myself i'm i'm just wondering like is that a theme of the movie that he could potentially find a way to split off a part of himself and kind of reprogram it so it's different, but that's not the same thing as two people coming together and you don't know what's going to happen, right? So I'm speculating he, on this yeah. on, on this point. Um, uh, so I because because I have no way of knowing this. Me neither. Oh, she mad. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, what if it was the point for the puppet master to? not just to create but because he is an ai and he does not have a ghost mm. the major does and she's open to sharing her ghost with him gotcha this gotcha. is the closest thing that he can come to an interaction of 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 emotion of you know Interesting. yeah may, may not be love but it's some right. type of emotional inner interconnectedness with with that yeah. ghost that's a great point I like that. I was gonna say certainly to the point of like copy and paste and making a clone mm -hmm. that the puppet master can't achieve the ghost of a person. Mm, so the right. only way the puppet master can get close is literally to intertwine with an actual mm -hmm. ghost. Yeah. So that what makes the puppet master different, the sentience yeah. that makes the puppet master difference, yeah. will never cross the divide unless it he's able or it's able yeah. to interlace with an actual ghost and then that brings from the ai complete machine into that interface with mm -hmm. being something more not quite human yeah but no longer a machine and to be clear for those screaming at us we mm -hmm. recognize that in the movie they say the puppet master has a ghost that that, that ai has a ghost but the term ghost is ambiguous in that world, right? Yeah. Um, the puppet master has something like a ghost, <laughs> uh, the right. AI equivalent of a ghost, but it's not necessarily a human ghost. So it has I think, a you know, sentience of its own. Right, you know, so um, um, even though it, it technically follows the pattern of a ghost, I very much like your, your point, Steve, that he's saying, yeah, but I'm, I'm this kind of ghost. You know, I'm, I'm this kind of entity. I don't know if that's a real ghost. It's just a it's a thing. I want to merge with a a human ghost to to know that this is a real uh, a real thing. Yeah. A highly evolved machine, mm -hmm. but not human. Right. So I want to know what's what it means to cross from the highly evolved machine mm -hmm. to humanity. Yeah. Which further complicates the question of why isn't that enough? Right. Yeah. Um, wh why why would it feel a need to do that? Right to, to to go on and do that. It's and it it um, gives rise to all all these kind of follow on questions around why would a an entity like that who cannot die feel that death and propagation is a natural consequence of being alive? Why couldn't it just right. say, well, I'm just an AI. I don't need that part of being human. I'm just going to continue doing that thing. Has it unconsciously patterned itself off of human? concepts of what it means to be a real entity right a real boy <laughs> right you, you know where it's like what if you could just go on and do that thing but you're, you're you've convinced yourself if you will that this this is what it means to be um alive would be the the, the, the right term yeah i guess cause he doesn't want to be human per se but yeah it's it's complicated which i mean it addresses that greater question of like from whether you start as an amoeba or you're yeah. a more multi-celled uh create you know being mm -hmm. that the urge to propagate yeah 
is there, but it's not Universal. just to it's not to copy. To be sentient is mm -hmm. to be aware of oneself, but also wish to pass oneself on, mm -hmm. not just as a cookie cutter, but yeah. as something as an element of a larger concept. Right. So the major provides that window to the larger Absolutely. propagation and existence. Yeah, the, the 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 need to you know exist and breed exists well beyond humanity. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not the big brain thinkers. But it's all the way down to single celled mm -hmm. organisms that like you know they're doing their thing because that's mm -hmm. what it does. Yeah. Which yeah. begs the question in Transformers: What do the people of Cybertron? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I mean. Transformers has such a deep philosophical core to it. We could just spend days talking about. You yeah, know, Osh Oshi's got nothing. Which we may have to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Particularly the live action Michael Bay movies. I mean, just they're so deep. Yeah. They're so complicated. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the All Spark. Doesn't yeah. that just talk about the soul in all of us? Pretty, Pretty much. Mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. It basically like goes in the shell. Kitty pool. Yeah, it's Ghost in the Shell, but much more airplane and car related. <laughs> Here's my thesis. Megatron as the bad guy puppet master. No. Ah. Uh, the major is Optimus Prime. Of course. Yes. Mm. Who sacrifices himself. No, we're not going to that. Exactly. <laughs> I refuse to dignify those movies by seriously comparing them to Ghost in the Shell. Transform um, and roll out. Autobots. Any other thoughts on Ghost in the Shell? It was a fun ride. Yeah. I laughed. I cried. <laughs> well, I, I mean, Didn't again, I, I experienced it, existential dread. Yeah. <laughs> having encountered it through Adult Swim yeah. and, like, encountered it as usual, like Bebop or, ADV or Inuyasha, where it's like, I'm on episode, I don't know what, and I have no mm -hmm. idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, okay. The the film gave me more of you know a book ended experience where I'm like okay I sort of kind of know what's going on with the characters mm -hmm. visually yeah. and now I've got the story background of like you know there's a section six there's a section nine mm -hmm. there's these kind of things that are going on that I kind of wish I had seen the film before I encountered mm. the bits and pieces of the series on Adult yeah. Swim, mm -hmm. because then I would be able to more effectively, knowing where my character base is, lock in right. what the heck was happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is a tough thing about Ghost in the Shell, particularly for the, the, the series, and I, I will point this out to people. Like, when that TV series came out in Japan, everyone knew what it was. Right. You know, they didn't need to spend three episodes establishing the characters in Section 9 and so forth. It's just that it goes. Um, there's some introduction, but it, it's very much we assume you know this. It's kind of like Harry Potter. Where it's like, yeah, we're gonna give you this yeah. stuff, but you you all have read this. Um, um, so yeah, I, I I totally get that, John. Yeah, when the series came out, I of course had already seen Ghost in the yeah. Shell years prior, so I I knew exactly you know to Brent's point. I was like, ah, it's Ghost in the Shell, so yeah. I I didn't need any of that, you know. Yeah. Hey, this is this, this is this, this is this, and this is this. But it does help people who are watching it, um, you know, <clears throat> um, to understand a little bit more of what's of why it's more talky and not gunny. Yeah. Right. And again, for folks screaming at us, we know Ghost in the Shell movie is not set in the same timeline right. as the TV right. series. The TV series. We get that. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's helpful. Absolutely. You know, yes. So, yeah. It's yelling because, aside, it's helpful for people who are trying to get into yeah. mm -hmm. something that is, you know, popular and in the sort of, you know, zeitgeist of, of the world of anime. Yeah. It helps people to get in to understand who then come back to the other things. A thousand percent. Right? You, you get the thema thematics of the movie in the show, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's what's important. Yeah. Steve, you know a ton about Ghost in the Shell. What have we missed? <clears throat> Let me bring pull down the chart. Um, <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> um, it, it there's a there's there's a lot in this movie, and I had to watch it multiple times. You're not going to get it all in the first watch. Uh, I'm just going to tell everybody that. Um, it is if you treat it just by itself, that's a good way to start, and just to you know just to basically experience it on the first run through and then on the second run through pay a little bit more attention to um as 
to the talky parts. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's kind of hard. Um, but it is relevant to the story and it makes it far more uh, enjoyable. So, you know, you cover obviously what it means to be human. Why do we, why did, why is propagation important? You know, the, the mind and um, you know, what, what is, what is the ghost? Those are the major factors in there, but there are also the other points of, well, Here's the technology. Isn't it messed up that somebody can take over your mind and completely mind wipe you and have the point in the movie where they tell you we don't have the technology to fix you? Yeah. So, you know, there's there's those things in it. There's elements of risk in this world. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about how this world is is a lot different. The political geopolitical um, world is, is so different. Yeah. This is after World War Three, a nuclear war. Mm-hmm. What a lot, that's what a lot of people don't realize is that this is this is Japan after a nuclear war. Japan is also alone in the world um, mm. as being a very structured society. American Empire is the only really only other country in the world that is that structured to the point where they don't need other nations to gain with each other to survive. Um, Japan is is very um, very much like that. Um, as far as the cyberpunk movie which is that is definitely what this is this is definitely a cyberpunk movie it does it lines more up with blade runner mm-hmm. than anything else in so far that there is like we were saying earlier no dystopian i no dystopian um you know um things going on yeah. that you would in altered carbon and things like mm-hmm. that but rather um in blade runner again we were talking about roy batty who wants more life yeah. experiences aren't just these photographs that they program into your brain that mm-hmm. but you know as he gives the wonderful speech of you know oh when i die everything goes away you know like tears in the rain ghost in the shell is like an animated version of that without the boycott machines mm-hmm. um and 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 the fact that it does talk about instead of just a short lifespan it talks about you know what if you did go on forever what if you know you know what if you do have that what you know how does that shape you how do you move forward and as we pointed out you know maybe you just get bored to the point where maybe this is a very attractive idea because it will be a huge major change in your life as we see in the last part of the of the movie when bato um puts her brain into a basically what amounts to a child's um cybernetic form Mm -hmm. um you know, he's just like, this is what I could get. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of, kind of gives you another idea of how the actual world works, mm-hmm. and um, and the fact that she is going underground. Mm-hmm. Why is she going underground? Because she's a whole new being. She is something the world has never seen before. Yeah. And that's a whole nother that's a whole nother concept. Yeah. Um, percent. You know, it's bit... funny you mention that, Steve, because it's like now thinking about it, like, yeah, wait a minute hold on, why didn't he just go back to the office and be like, hey, here's the major's head, <laughs> and uh, she kind of got all screwed up and stuff. It yeah. only just now clicked when you said that. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, crap. She's the she's the merge between the puppet master and her ghost. Mm-hmm. So now it's not exactly like she can just go back to the office and get, hey, whip me up a new yeah. body. Nope. Because right. they're going to want to pull her apart and figure out what changed. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Damn, and, and, I hadn't even thought about that. And, and it's been like how long since yeah. we watched this? <laughs> well, and, I mean, even more pragmatically than that, that's not the major anymore. Right. right? Yeah. She doesn't have the same security clearances, all that kind of stuff, because she's not the same individual. <laughs> yeah. There's all kinds of different things going on inside her brain now yep. in her ghost that don't make her the same anymore. Wow. Yeah. And, and, one, and, one, and one last point that I want to point out yeah. is beginning in the end of the movie. She dreams. She's asleep. Her body doesn't need sleep, but her yeah. mind does. Yeah. At the end of the movie, she's a new being, and she's coming out mm. of his sleep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up, and you brought up the idea of multiple viewings. I know a lot of people are kind of allergic to multiple viewings. They think that's the sign of a bad movie, if you can't understand it the first time. Uh, Ghost in the Shell is one of those movies that's kind of the opposite of that, where there's so much to absorb that yeah. if you come at it the first time saying, I'm going to get it, you're not going to have a good time. No. <laughs> you know, no. you come in saying, I'm going to experience this world. I'm going to experience this story and these characters. And 
get what I can out of it and get get what I can. And this doesn't mean you're you know you're dumb or that the movie doesn't won't make no, sense the first time around. Right. Yeah. It just means that there's multiple levels going on here and it's overwhelming to try to process all of it at once. It's totally fine to go into yeah. this multiple times and, and, and mine it as needed. Yeah. Okay, here's a question. Mm. What films can you think of, animated or otherwise, that would not be worth a second viewing to pick up on the things you missed? I have many. Um, really? Well, but... other than like Hand of Manos. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> I, I think for this, um, hmm. the, the recent slime film that came hmm. out this, this summer, for there's a lot of animated films that I can think, I've seen Akira, I don't even know how hmm. many times. Right. And it's like there are things to that I, it would surprise me someone would be like, no, I've seen Ghost in the Shell, the movie, once. Mm. It's like there's so much to pick out of it mm-hmm. by watching it a second time that it's like it surprises me that folks would not want to give us a second go so that they could get to the end and be like, oh, my God, you're right. She can't go back to Section 9. She's different. Like I, it, I we've seen this film a couple times now, and I missed that. You know what I mean? So it's it's just interesting to think of like there are films that maybe you would be like, I don't want to see it a second time. But like, no, there's there's still nuances you can pull from them. Don't cancel me. <laughs> I don't need to watch Mugen Train a second time. It would be fun. I would enjoy yeah. myself, but I don't think I would pick up on new nuances in that mm, film. Right. Right? It's, it's not its point. It's, it, its goal is not to do that. Right. I might actually get something out of it because, I, but I don't know a lot about Demon Slayer, mm. so watching Mugen Train might, you know what I mean? I might be able to pick some more stuff out. Versus, I was entertained in watching it, mm-hmm. but I, maybe I didn't understand enough about it that now I understand a little bit more, so I could go back and be like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> you know, I kind of get that." I, well, it, it, I think. I, go ahead. No, I was going to say, for me, I think it's Belladonna and the Sadness. I don't think I need to see that <laughs> ever, ever. Um, well, and I think we may be getting down to the definitional things here. The, the, the question is, do you need to see it a second time? Right? Like, like mm. That's where right. I think that the separation is. Like, there are a lot of movies where I'm like, I'm fine watching that once. If I went back to it, I'd enjoy it. I might pick up, I might notice other things. Right. But right. It's, it, it's not going to... Um, change your life <laughs> change my life or is you know I, I'm, I'm not going to get as much out of that as I would watching a new movie mm. right yeah, fair fair um, whereas I think Ghost in the Shell Perfect Blue movies like that like you can come back to and get new layers yeah. of those films almost like it's a new experience every time you watch it oh Paprika holy living. yeah yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> watch Ghibli films <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. A lot of those were like a multi viewing is like, you know, you're gonna you're gonna suss out of this a lot, yeah. some a lot of little bits and pieces that you're like, oh yeah. To that point, Spirited Away is actually one that I think a lot of folks sleep on in that sense, because when you're first watching Spirited Away, Chihiro's attitude and her personality change is a little hard to read. Mm. And I think when you come back to it, you realize, oh, she's on this journey to become more mature. That's the through line of the film. I think that becomes right. more clear in the second viewing. Um, it's not that it's obscure the first time going through, but I think you can, you know, you, you can appreciate that through line better on a second viewing. Stuff like that. Well, once the, like Boy of the Heron, I mm. can't wait for us, for us to do Boy <clears> of the Heron. <throat> yeah. Because I was just, oh, in watching it. Mm-hmm. And I can't wait to go through and then pick apart the bits of it. Yeah, I need to watch that about five times, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Which we may get there. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that'll do it for Ghost in the Shell. That Thank you both for all those thoughts. That was great. Thank you, thanks. Roanoke Station signing off. All right. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. Man, it has been great having Steve here. If you haven't had a chance to hang out with good friends lately, come up with an excuse. You know, Ghost in the Shell explores what it means to be human and how important it is for Section 9 to rely on each other. So hang out with other people that you can rely on. 
especially if you can watch some anime with them. That'll do it for today. Thanks for watching, and until next time, watch more anime.